and this is a part of our teaser lectures in IRVR. This is the second teaser lecture, and we will introduce IRVR as a department and the programs we have at the moment. So welcome to the introduction. It's, there is an app for that, how digital technologies and social media can shape our health. For those of you who arrived a few uh, minutes later, I am Professor Patrick Koskova, um, Professor of Digital Health in IRDR UCL, and I'm the Director of UCL IRDR Center for Digital Public Health in Emergencies. We will take you through this exciting domain of digital public health, and you will investigate at various approaches and novel technologies and interventions, helping us to manage our healthcare and helping our digital health experts at national and international level to predict, prevent, and respond to pandemics. Well, I'm sure all of you are using mobile phones and all of you have got loads of exciting apps and you contributing to social media and the news. However, it's interesting to investigate how many of us are actually looking into healthcare data and managing our health using our mobile phones. Unsurprisingly enough, um, in the US, the number of people who have been using their mobile phones, not just for pure communication, but for managing their healthcare has gone up, has doubled since um, 2010 to 2020. People are using their mobile phones all over the world, in every conditions and every country. However, what kind of data we are getting from our mobile phones, how do we sharing our data and how we can make the best use of our apps and phones to improve our healthcare and the health of our population. My research doesn't look just at interventions using mobile phones, although you will see some examples of my research in various continents uh, developing interventions using apps. We also look into big data. Data are being streamed these days from any kind of devices. It could be your Fitbit or your Apple Watch monitoring your heartbeat, your number of steps and the activities you are taking every single day. It's going to be any kind of wearable device like these uh, lady downstairs wearing quite a high number of devices and streaming it to the internet through IoT connection. Or people could be measuring their weight and being in a weight loss programs and transmitting their reduced weight to colleagues and friends on a weight loss group over the internet. People can also be immediately in real time sharing their physiological conditions through IoT devices built into their tracking and wearable uh, devices to inform clinicians. For example, people with um, heart conditions, long-term heart conditions, have got trackers of their heart immediately enforcing uh, their right behavior, but also informing clinicians if their heart is not behaving according to the given pattern. So the real-time data, the big data, I speak available everywhere and transmitted to sometimes the healthcare sector, the clinicians and us as citizens and, um, and users, but also being shared and used by big data IT companies. It's not just the data, it's also the role of the media. And the media are incredibly excited about pandemics and epidemic. This is a big topic, this makes the headline. Unfortunately, it's often the uh, the right wing, uh, not necessarily evidence based made media who are informing public and spreading misinformation, fake news and information which is scaring public and creating obviously good sales and marketing uh, opportunity, but not necessarily being involved in rigorous, responsible evidence based information of public. 
risk communication about public health information is really important. And we, would, we as experts, and obviously you as citizens, have got a mutual responsibility to treat the media and social media world as something with a bit of a caution and a pinch of salt to try to be realistic and reasonable about where the information comes from, who is behind, is it evidence-based or is it politically motivated or commercially motivated? So as we got on top of the infodemia, which is like epidemia, but for information and get really responsible information out to citizens as opposed to spreading or continuing to spread fake news. Some of them, as you know, come from the highest politicians like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil or from uh, Donald Trump in the US. So it's our mutual responsibility to treat media with a pinch of salt. I'll take you through a number of um, research uh, topics where we have been working in the public health over the last uh, 20 years. The first challenge, the first example, will take us back 10 years to 2009, when we had the previous epidemics. It was the swine flu. Those of you who remember, spine flu initially looked like it's going to be devastating and really difficult. There was a massive outcry and fear and anxiety in the spring and the first wave in 2009. But at the end, it hasn't proven to be as lethal uh, throughout the year 2009 as um, the COVID-19 is proving to be this year. Our work in 2009 looked at very novel and uh, exciting media, the Twitter. At the time, it wasn't a commercial tool. It wasn't used by politicians and commercial organizations and media agencies. It was a kind of a geeky thing to do where you have to even type RT to retweet a tweet you like from someone else. At the time, we investigated Twitter as a media which could actually be successfully used for early warning of upcoming epidemics. And we demonstrated that Twitter actually has a potential to predict a spike in epidemics up to two to three weeks before the official data and the official surveillance authorities will know in the UK and in the US. So let's watch this BMJ film, bringing us back to the role of Twitter demonstrated a successful value for early warning for the swine flu in 2009. A single idea has the potential to change healthcare forever. And the UK has an impressive tradition of innovation that has transformed healthcare. In countries where the government is suppressing free media, Twitter or any public generated content on the internet and social networks could be an invaluable resource identifying possible infectious disease outbreaks. Our final presenter is Dr. Patty Kostkova. She is going to talk about how e-health and social networks will improve global health by 2020. I have a question for you. How many of you have got this device on you at the moment? Virtually everyone. So my talk will show you how we can make the use of our day-to-day -day communication device for improving our health. As people and diseases travel the world, Europeans face an increasing range of threats from existing and new epidemics. Stockholm is where Europe's watchdog agency was set up. We have come to the ECDC, the European Centre of Disease Prevention and Control, which has got remit to support European nations and member states in regular surveillance of infectious diseases and providing scientific advice. Patty, this is our Hall of Fame. Here you have the infected mosquitoes during the chikungunya outbreak in, in Ravenna. This one was during the tsunami response in Banda Aceh in 2004. This is in Iraq during the avian influenza cases in 2006. This one was a hospital infection investigation in Russia, minus 24 degrees. <laughs> Actually, the center was created after the SARS epidemic, where the member state realized that for such threats as SARS with a global 
uh, scope, then there is a need to have some coordination at the, at the EU level. In 2005, there was an outbreak of chikungunya, that funny tropical disease originating in Central Africa. So we decided to conduct a risk assessment because that's really what we've been created for. What's the risk for the EU if a situation emerges somewhere in the world? Everyone was convinced that indeed there was a risk for the EU to see some transmission occurring there. So then the preparedness group start working with the member state to make sure that if it happens, we have the capacity in the EU mm. to diagnose it. That, yeah. Nobody was able to diagnose that disease in the EU because it never happened in the EU. Yeah. And then in August 2008, we had the confirmation by Italy that indeed the uh, establishment of the local transmission in Emilia-Romagna had started. And it was exactly the story that our risk assessment showed. It was actually one guy coming back from India meeting at the wrong time, the wrong mosquito, and starting a transmission yeah, yeah, yeah. ended up with more than 200 cases. The spread of this disease from Italy was contained, and the ECDC learned about how to prevent future outbreaks of chikungunya. Early warning of epidemics is crucial, and that's why the team constantly monitors both medical reports and all the world's media. A daily meeting considers current threats. On other news, uh, there was an AWS from Belgium yesterday reporting uh, an outbreak of measles in Ken. We knew about this because it was in the media, at least, that there was this situation in Belgium, so they gave a bit more details about this. Uh, so we got it in the media before we got it from the National yeah, Authority. Yeah, it was a week before, That's I would good. say. Last year was the worst year in a couple of years that we had in the EU for measles, and what you're saying is that this year so far it seems to be even worse. So. to tell the world, or at least the followers, what you do at the moment. What you had for breakfast, whether you had a shower, which talk you're attending, what happened at your work. So what about swine flu? We have done a study collecting all tweets containing the word flu. How many tweets containing this world do you think we have received? Any guess? 10, 20, 1,000? Surprisingly enough, we received 3 million tweets from all over the world discussing some kind of aspect of the pandemic or forwarding some of these articles mentioning the influenza. So we look at these particular tweets and compare to what the surveillance data from GPs actually told us about number of cases in the UK last year. And the Twitter discussion slightly anticipated the surveillance reported data. So the Twitter discussions in this large quantity, even though with the noise, which is part of it, can actually predict the pandemic up to a week, in this case, before the official surveillance, which is important to know for the authorities, for preparedness, for organizations like WHO, ECDC. The vast uh, amount of data can indicate there is some kind of public concerns and we can crowdsource the intelligence straight to those people who might be affected. Prior to the internet, my concern was to get as much information as I could. Now that I have internet, my concern is to get, I wouldn't say as little as I can, but as relevant information as I can. Yeah. I do feel a little bit skeptical about using using social media for early detection. I think it's definitely a, a tool or a development that we need to be following up very much in the way that you've been doing with your groundbreaking uh, scientific work. Don't you think investing into research into the social media and not just Twitter, including you know blogs, yeah. any of this user generated content on the web and finding out technologically better adjusted methods? Indeed, it could lives. be great to get some students or interns and get a project, look at the threats, what Google gave us, what the tweets would give us, what medicines and the media would give us. What, what, the, what the blogs could give us. We have a new increase of cases in the Sud province. And in the, Sud. the beauty of Twitter was, this was tapping into resource people are using anyway. People are using in their daily life to tell their friends. We are piggybacking on this daily process 
and capitalizing on this new way of communication and using it for public health purposes. So I hope you enjoyed the film, taking us back 10 years to the previous um, uh, pandemic, the spine flu pandemic 2009, to understand how at the time a novel social media called Twitter could actually help in predicting uh, the epidemics and potentially saving lives through allowing the authorities longer time for preparedness. Those of you who join us uh, later, uh, my name is Patti Koskeva. I am the professor of digital health at UCL. I work in the IRDR, the Institute of Risk and Disaster Reduction, and I'm also the director of the UCL IRDR Center for Digital Public Health in Emergencies. So most warm welcome for everyone who joined us to listen to the second teaser talk of IRDR, introducing our exciting research, which suddenly became very topical this year, to our prospective students, and also for anyone who is interested in managing their health and contributing to public health science using technology. So moving on from um, swine flu and using Twitter, let's go to Brazil. I'm fortunate enough that my research takes me all over the world and I'm fortunate to work in uh, the northeast part of Brazil where one of the other um, epidemics have been raging, especially in 2014. It's the Zika virus. Zika is um, a tropical disease which is transmitted by mosquitoes, it's a vector-borne disease. You can catch it from being uh, bitten by a mosquito, which is um, endemic in the tropical parts of the world, not just Brazil, but in Brazil, the biggest um, pandemics has occurred in 2014 where a very high number of uh, pregnant women got infected and unfortunately transmitted the disease to their newborn babies who were developed with a defection, with a brain defection called microcephaly. So Zika virus is not necessarily a fatal disease for humans. The mortality is much lower than for diseases like, for example, Ebola. However, if um, contracted in pregnancy, it can have a fatal infection diseases and results for, uh, for the fetus. So what do we do in Brazil to combat um, the Zika virus? At the moment, um, hundreds of people called healthcare agents uh, in Brazil, in various cities in this tropical region where Zika is endemic, are regularly surveying properties in order to find out if there is any dangerous standing water where mosquitoes could happily breathe. Mosquitoes are transmitting also other diseases, chikungunya and dengue fever, and also in Africa it could be the West Nile virus and obviously uh, malaria. So mosquitoes are not actually human-friendly creatures, are they? So what do we do with those health agents in Northeast Brazil? At the moment, they're visiting the properties and see if there is any breathing point or hotspot uh, with mosquitoes breathing in people's um, gardens or uh, sheds. And they just, if they find it out, they destroy them. So they're trying to control the mosquito populations in order to limit the transmission of um, Zika or chikungunya or uh, dengue fever to humans and limit the human number of cases and fatalities. At the moment, they're using a paper-based system. So they have to fill in a paper form every time they visit a property to record if the property is infected with mosquitoes or not and how they treated it. We developed a mobile app the agents can be using to record the information online and immediately transmit the data back to their back office, to their managers in public health and environmental offices. So as the information could be directly collated on a map, and the managers and public health officers can see where are the hotspots, where are the mosquitoes breeding at the moment, and what they need to do to summon and direct their resources to quickly combat um, these high risk breathing areas, as opposed to normally walking around in their kind of cycles and visiting properties um, as if the probability of the infection was the same. So as you can see on the map of Recife, the capital of Pernambuco, the state in the north east Brazil where we work, you can see some of the kind of red dots, the highest areas where mosquitoes were identified by the agents collecting information using the mobile system. And the uh, managers could actually track the details of those highest areas and identify which properties are 
uh, infected and what they need to do about it to summon the resource, send more agents there to quickly eradicate um, the mosquito bleeding spoils and limit uh, the transmission of mosquitoes in this area. It's not just mobile games, uh, mobile uh, apps being used for data collection and for early warning and data analytics and um, predictions. Mobile phone could be used for something much more fun. What about games? I'm sure many of you are playing computer games. Lots of games ha have made their way online and on obviously mobile devices. However, serious games are a discipline of um, uh, entertainment games, looking at games which has got some kind of purpose, trying to teach the user something important, improve the knowledge, change attitude, affect behavior. So serious games are a really important part of computer science, specifically applied to digital public health, where public health interventions traditionally developed through leaflets in GP surgeries, which didn't affect many people and didn't easily draw attention and engagement are suddenly being delivered in a personalized way right onto your phone. Those of you who are gamers and who like playing games, you might be interested to learn about our other project. It was an EU initiative developed in the UK and translated with partners in 10 European Union countries. And then beyond that, it was uh, under, uh, translated by more countries through our collaboration with ECDC, the center in Stockholm you've seen in the movie earlier. And the objective of the project was uh, teaching junior and senior school children, so those age um, uh, 10 to 12 and then 13 to 16 teenagers, what actually are the basics of hygiene, antibiotics, microbes across the European Union. You can see we have a very talented artist. They have drawn uh, the kind of cartoony version of various microbes, like you can see fungi, bacteria, viruses, in the real shape and also in the real sizes. So fungi are bigger than bacteria, bacteria are bigger than viruses. So by playing the game, the kids have already started learning something through the game visuals and the game mechanics. Something they would normally be learning just from a textbook or a traditional, traditional lecture style teaching. They loved it. They also have learned that microbes could be found in various locations. Well, we can't see them, but they happen to be living in our kitchen, maybe making the bread go moldy. They also are inside our bodies. They can make us ill. And also they could be on our skin. We can wash them off with good hand hygiene practice and hand washing practice. Or they can also make us ill if we happen not to be washing our hands. So there was a lot of public health educational messages and learning objectives developed in this um, EBAC and um, EduGames for All game. So just to illustrate what the game actually looked like. Um, so this particular um, level in the junior game, the game aimed at a small primary school children, was very simple. All you have to do is um, jump up as an avatar. You can see this girl on a skateboard and push loose like the pasty loose into a pint of milk. If you do it three times, wow, the milk turns into a yogurt. So this learning objective actually was showing that some bacteria could actually be put in good use. We're, making, we're using them to make yogurt. We're also using them to make bread. So not all bags are bad. It was a very popular learning objective and very good kind of mechanics to teach the message. And we have measured the highest knowledge gain in this very um, game surrounded by the uh, little being turned into a milk. Another learning objective was introducing the concept of antibiotic resistance. I'll be, I'll be speaking about antibiotic resistance in detail later on in our African project, but some of you have may heard that antibiotic resistance is as important and as topical subject as a human challenge as global warming. We do need to slow it down. We do need to do something about it. Otherwise, the um, antibiotics we've been using for over um, half a century will stop working and we will be starting to get ill and won't be able to have cure just like in 19th century. It's a very critical, very timely and challenging problem. Part of it is not actually finishing the course of antibiotics if you will prescribe antibiotics by your GP. 
So in the game, the learning objective was to teach the child that even though you may feel a bit better after two or three days, you should still finish the course of antibiotics as your GP or your doctor has instructed you. So um, the play has got antibiotics and she's throwing them at this horrible purple infection in the body. See how it's disappearing. Wow, it's all gone. But it looks like it's all gone. But actually, she hasn't used all the antibiotics given by her GP. She still has some left in her pocket. So what happens? Is the infection gone? Wow, it's not gone. It grows back. So the player through the mechanics is taught that even the very last capsule has to be used, the course has to be finished as prescribed in order for the um, infection to be fully eradicated and go away and not to contribute to the bugs becoming, becoming uh, resistant and contributing to this global issue of antibiotic resistance. The children love to play the game. They have been in all countries in, uh, in Europe where we introduced it initially in English, then it was translated into their local languages. They really enjoyed it. And we look into evaluating what knowledge gain they have, so what they learn by all of these learning objectives being taught through these exciting games mechanics. And we also understood actually is the game mechanics, which is teaching them just like, you know, throwing the capsule to this horrible purple infection or pushing Lucy into a mill, which helps them to understand the concept behind, as opposed to just reading it initially in English. But even when the translations were available for European children, it hasn't really improved their understanding. The game mechanics is something which is facilitating the learning much faster and more stable and long-term than just reading it in, in text. So the future of um, serious games and educational games for public health purposes is enormous. You may think, well, games are just for children, right? I'm sure you all, you all play games. You may not actually want to admit it, but you may actually think, well, would it be any use of serious games and mobile games outside of the Western world where we all I use the mobile phones and have time in our hands and are using these devices on a daily basis since our childhood. What about if we look at countries in low income settings? Well, one of our most challenging and rewarding projects was based in Nepal, a tiny country in Asia where the Himalayas are, which is really one of the poorest countries in the world and where women who live in the rural areas are not just living in a very uh, deprived condition, but also having got a good education. And the ownership of mobile phone, even smartphone, is something which is very, very rare. It was exciting to lead the project mantra, teaching um, women in Nepal in a district called Kavre, one of the districts which were worst affected by the 2014 earthquakes in Nepal, about improving their healthcare and um, the health of their newborn babies to improve their resilience and understand which conditions are dangerous so as they can immediately seek healthcare assistance and sometimes be transported to a healthcare facility, you know, taking hours to be carried out or driven out from their little village, or which conditions are kind of normal or usual, they don't have to worry about it. That's something which happens to many newborn babies. So understanding the risk of uh, neonatal and maternal conditions have been a very important thing to teach through this project because the uh, female mortality, the women's mortality in childbirth is really, really high in the pool. This game has to understand that the people may not actually have a C mobile phone. They have no. And many of them, it was the first time they had to use mobile phone when we came over to analyze and evaluate this game. Also, as I mentioned, many of them haven't got um, an education. So the um, illiteracy in Nepal, especially among women, is unfortunately still really high. So the game couldn't uh, include any text, any instructions, anything in obviously English, but not even Nepalese, because many of them can't read. So it was entirely graphical game, entirely using just pictograms and images and features which are drawing from the local culture where they would understand what is right or wrong, what is the correct, incorrect answer, what are they getting points for, etc. The game includes three modules, maternal health, neonatal health and geohazards. Geohazards include things like rock falls or river, river overflowings, 
Unfortunately, more people died after the 2014 earthquake than during the actual earthquake because of little understanding and little awareness of geohazards such as rock falls and landslides. So the game also taught uh, the users about the danger and about the risk they may be undertaking if they are crossing uh, rivers or cracks in, a, in the ground or walking underneath a potential risk rock, rockfall uh, area to protect their lives. Well, as I mentioned, the game, game had to be really simplistic. So it was using a simple uh, drag and drop um, mechanics. We have to do um, a quick tutorial to teach them drag and drop. We developed, we took a picture of one of the women and her baby. And in the tutorial of the game, we kind of cut out the baby from the mother. And it was obviously one of the women from the village. So she absolutely was delighted to see that her baby has actually made it into the game's tutorial. And they have to go and drag the baby into the mother's arms to actually complete the initial photograph. So after they completed this tutorial, they were playing the actual game. And in the game, they have been uh, playing the maternal, neonatal, and geohazards level, teaching them to understand how to simply distinguish what is critical, where, for example, like on this picture, you know, a serious bleeding du during childbirth uh, is a serious condition. They should immediately be transferred by an ambulance to the nearest health facility. Something like a wild discharge is very common during pregnancy. There's nothing to worry about. They could just be seen by a local nurse, like this lovely lady at the picture below. Communicating what's right and what's wrong in the game, again, had to be obviously non-textual. So we have discussed with our local uh, stakeholders, organizations called HERD, based in Kathmandu, doing an amazing work across Nepal in improving the quality of life and health of maternal, maternal health and health of women. And they just thought, well, you know, if something is right, if something is positive, Nepalese would like to listen to a sound of singing birds. So they gave us this um, audio and if the uh, movement, if the step is completed correctly, we play the singing birds and gave a kind of a fireworks image. However, if they got it wrong, if they have chosen the wrong condition for the critical or less critical um, transfer to hospital or a healthcare facility, they receive a black cross. And also based on the Nepalese input, uh, the sound associated with something wrong with a thunderstorm. So yeah, birds or thunderstorm would, would immediately communicate, immediately get feedback to women playing the game, whether they're getting it right or getting it wrong. You may also see this lovely uh, flowers, the pink and yellow and purple with lovely leaves. These leaves are actually poignant. So if they get something right, the flower grows a leaf. And when they get the whole stem full of leaves, they can complete uh, this level and receive um, a prize, a little um, flower, which they can collect throughout the game when the game gets faster and more difficult in order to enhance, improve, and reinforce learning. So everything has been discussed and iterated with uh, in focus groups with the herd partners in Kathmandu and also in focus group with the village women to make sure they understand what the game is teaching them, make sure we actually develop artwork and the communication the way they would uh, find it appropriate for their local settings. We evaluate the game to understand how successful it was in teaching the learning objectives defined for the maternal, neonatal and geohazards module. But we also run focus groups. We also wanted to know in a qualitative way how they enjoyed it. And we knew they enjoyed it. They really loved it. They didn't want to finish the session. Even though they have to walk back home from the session with us, they still wanted to play yet another game. It was an amazing experience for us researchers, sort of used to using mobile phones in Europe, where it is not a pressure a toy, but it's something which we are just used to and perhaps take for granted. From the focus group, it became quite clear that, you know, they really like playing the game, as you can see on the, uh, on the answers from this transcript. They also understood it's important for them to actually have better knowledge and be empowered about arguing for their health and health seek behavior, you know, transfer to a health facility when they're pregnant and also understand their child health. And if they do it, it's gonna help everyone. So even though they understood it's a bit of a game, they really grasp the idea of the game being empowering communication and influential to help them negotiate the right um, decisions when they are in danger or when their newborn baby is in danger. We're gonna move from Nepal, from Central Asia, 
to a tropical country in Africa. We work also in Nigeria, a big country in West Africa, where we developed a project using mobile technology to enhance a, a decision support for surgeons working in three settings in Lagos and in the Delta of Nigeria to better prescribe, to, to comply better with uh, WHO um, guidance for what surgical prophylaxis. So going back to the issue of antimicrobial resistance, as I mentioned, this is one of the most important issues of our generation. We really need a global leadership and global funding to be released to tackle the issue of antibiotic resistance. Otherwise, the global impact is drastic. We could be expecting about 10 billion of deaths by 2050. It could cost the economy a sixty-six trillion of dollars. And we would have to come back to times when basic diseases are no longer treatable. Antibiotic resistance is just uh, a phenomenon which is unstoppable, but could be slowed down where the bugs are getting used to the antibiotic. They quickly adapt and they can become much more robust and resist the treatment. One of the issues we can do about it, both professionals, healthcare providers, but also citizens, is limiting overprescribing. So getting prescriptions for a viral disease like a cough and cold, which doesn't need any antibiotics, wouldn't even work for, for antibiotics because it's a viral disease, is one of the things we all can do when we get ill in the winter. We should just think about getting to bed, taking a few days off, drinking lots of fluids, and not rushing to our GP and forcing our GP to give up antibiotics because we're contributing perhaps to antibiotic resistance. And if our infection is viral, we would get well anyway and the antibiotics will not even work for us. The project called um, Gadsdown has exactly this remit. It was looking into how we can reduce overprescribing of antibiotics. And it's not just public who are requesting or expecting prescriptions in, um, in situations uh, or for infections when it's not needed. It's also the professionals who sometimes go with the flow or go by the traditional way of prescribing who tend to overprescribe for infectious diseases. In this case of our project of Gazda, it was for surgical prophylaxis or surgical infections. So when a patient comes to um, um, a surgeon for a specific surgery to be undertaken, the surgeon makes a decision. Does this surgery need um, antibiotics to prevent potential infection, potential post-operative infection or not? And it obviously depends on the infection, it depends on the patients, is it a high or low risk patient, is it a high or low risk of surgery? And the decision is made which should follow WHO or Stanford or other major international guidelines in order to prescribe in accordance with the guidelines to limit antibiotic prescribing. So in this app, we have developed the decision support tree, assisting the surgeons to make the decision in accordance with the guideline. So we ask them, well, what is this patient actually undergoing? What is the surgery? Is the patient a high or low risk? And what are you intending to prescribe? And based on the data entered at the point of care, when this decision was made with the patient uh, in the room, we provide a feedback. And the feedback could be positive or negative. So positive feedback, like on the right hand side, basically it was reassuring the surgeon, yes, you made the right choice. This is exactly what WHO guidelines are recommending. Let's go ahead. The feedback on the left is red. Well, this decision doesn't seem to be in compliance with WHO guidelines. It looks like you should either prescribe something else or from for different duration. This is not in compliance. So immediate feedback, kind of reinforced learning about the um, antibiotic prescription, help the surgeons to be aware if when they are making a decision which is not in compliance, and it can give them a chance to rethink if they would perhaps prepare to prescribe something better, or if they felt they are entitled and they are, they are right about prescribing something not in compliance with WHO, which could be justified by some local conditions or the patient situation they would give us the reason. So we really understood what's happening at the point of care. This app has been very highly regarded, not just by um, the Nigerian surgeon, but also by many international organizations. We received uh, several awards for the Gatsda app. And also I received the Innovator of the Year Award last year, um, highlighting how important it is to actually use technology at the point of care to positively influence prescribing behavior.
We evaluated the app in those three hospitals. So you can say, you can see this one and this one are based in Lagos in the capital. And this one is in the uh, Delta region in the south of, um, of Nigeria with uh, over 90 surgeons who volunteers to use the app over six months and record the decisions and record obviously potentially change decisions as a result of using the app. It was amazing to see how many of them actually changed the decision and we have demonstrated that this app actually has got the potential to positively influence decision making and allow people to be more aware of when perhaps they are not quite making the decision which is in compliance and where there's a space of improvement. So from Africa, we move back to the UK. We are living in the midst of the biggest public health crisis of our century. Everyone has been affected by COVID-19. And my center has sprung into action because we actually felt we have so much expertise and experience in managing public health conditions and diseases. And we have opened several new projects to combat the virus. I'm gonna show you the one which has been uh, the largest project called My Lockdown Journal, launched very quickly, um, just when the lockdown was launched in the early April, we developed an app where users can um, record their daily activities to keep some kind of sense of normality, to know what they're doing every day. Are they moving things from face to face to online? Perhaps are they doing something a bit more, a bit longer? What keeps them happy? What makes them unhappy? So there is a well-being component and a kind of feel-good component through the app where we are trying to link it in our future initiative to behavior intervention, helping people to focus on activities and fulfill goals which keep their well-being and their mental health state through regular daily journaling. The app was also informed and underpinned by a large longitudinal study with 5,000 people answering questions about how they changed their lifestyle after the lockdown and now in the post lockdown or lo local lockdown, but still kind of social distancing periods, what they do else, what they do differently and how they manage their life in this difficult period. It was amazing to see how quickly people adjusted and how many people started new activities or got into activities which kept them happier in this difficult time. You can see on this um, on this world cloud that a lot of people have got into running and walking. And from the evaluation we have done so far in the preliminary data, the majority of people are now doing um, some some form of activity at least once a day. A lot of people also got into meditations, yoga, praying. Again, a lot of people are now doing some form of meditation, and yoga was the most popular at least once a day. It also was a big uh, generation difference. People in the older generation, sort of 65 years and above, they seem to be coping quite well, picking up new hobbies, catching up with their grandchildren on Zoom. A lot of younger people below 25 seem to be irritable, seem to be unhappy, and didn't seem to be you know, coping with the, the dramatic change of their life too well. In the middle, you can see our social media competition. You are all welcome to take part in. So we launched a competition called My Lockdown Journal. So if you send a picture of your journal or photograph or any activity demonstrating what you're doing in this current period and the post lockdown period, you will be retweeted. So you will become an influencer, get more visibility with your activity. You can also share your idea with others who are looking for inspiration on social media and in, through our apps. And you can be entered into our weekly competition. This is a picture from the first week to week one competition back in April, and we've been awarding the, the best um, social media activity prize every week for three months now. So do join, do follow us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram. It's my lockdown journal account, and do feel free and encouraged to share a fantastic picture I'm sure you all have about the activities you are doing now, or perhaps you're doing differently, or you would think maybe others could benefit from seeing what I do enhance and inspire their life in lockdown or after lockdown. The center has received a variety of prizes and media coverage. So going back to 
our work in, at UCL and my previous work um, on the EBAC project and uh, at City University. BBC gave us a lot of coverage around the games project. We have been also covered in the social media and television. And the Gatsda Nigerian Initiative has uh, been identified by the NIT Excellence Award last year by me being awarded the Innovator of the Year. IRDR, a uh, center of digital public health and emergencies, is looking at this variety of um, topics which suddenly became really important. People want to know how they can protect their health. People want to know how to stop infections and how we can be better prepared for the next pandemics and how we can manage this upcoming difficult time where we will continue to be living in social, with social distancing, local lockdowns, and maybe potentially a second wave coming up in our direction later in the year. So the work we do is directly affecting our lives on a daily basis and it's also providing data evidence and initiatives for the public health authorities and policymakers to decide about what is the best way to manage upcoming pandemics. If you're interested, do get in touch. I would like to thank you to everyone who has been involved in all of these projects in the past. Obviously my UCLD PhD team, my previous at the university team working on the games project and teams on the mantra, the Kagatsda, Educators for All and the Lockdown Journal. I'm specifically grateful for all our partners who are based in overseas, people in Nepal, people in Brazil, people in Nigeria. We have a new project um, in, in South Africa and it's amazing to work people all around the globe with a common goal, improving public health, protecting citizens and improving what we can deliver as scientists jointly with the stakeholders on the ground and users who are using our tools to make the world a safer and healthier place. Thank you very much for listening to me. If you want to get in touch, this is my email. Do follow me on Twitter, Pati Koskova, or do follow the PhD Center on Twitter. And I look forward to uh, welcoming you in IRVR in the end of autumn. If you are uh, our upcoming uh, student who received an offer from IRVR, we really look forward to having you around um, either virtually or face-to-face uh, -face if possible. At the beginning of the term, you can learn so much about um, public health. And if you're interested from personal reasons, do join us in any other, any other projects and uh, get in touch. It's an exciting and amazing area to get involved in right here, right now. Thank you for listening. Okay, so um, thank you so much. So we have the FAQ um, section at the bottom. Um, if anyone have you any questions or any suggestions, anything you would like to ask me or bring up the discussion, please can you just type into the FAQ session and I will pick up the uh, questions and, um, and answer them. So while you are thinking about your questions and I'm sure a lot of you are typing into it at the moment, there's an interesting area which I haven't mentioned in my talk, which also is quite dear to my heart, and it's privacy of user data. As you know, data privacy and data ownership has become a really topical thing in 21st century. Just like perhaps oil was uh, the most important commodity in 20th century, data has become the most important commodity in 21st century. We as a society globally have to think about how do we govern the data more responsibility more responsibly, how we measure who has got the profit and who has got the responsibility. How do we give citizens and users the right to decide about how they would like their data to be managed, shared, and maybe commercially exploited. At the moment, we have a um, major disparity in very strict regulation of the healthcare system of data, like the NHS in the UK, where your data records would be very well protected and there is a long-term decades lasting system. On the other hand, we all sharing data through mobile apps and through social media, which is normally owned and used by the IT companies running those apps and those, those uh, platforms. And they're using it to make trillion build income while nothing comes back to the user who's generating the data. 
this is specifically said if it uses from low income settings where the awareness of you know fake news and data abuse and usage is even lower than in uh, in the western world so understanding the ethical side of data usage understanding who and how we can govern our data with more responsibility and the power and decision control being returned to the user, the owners of the data, is something which is the, one of the biggest challenges of the coming decade. So still, if you have any other questions, please uh, tie them into the FAQ box. Okay, one of the interesting things uh, at my research, which was asked uh, before is, well, it's kind of two, two fold uh, research. We're not just kind of researchers who would go to certain country, collect data and publish a paper. It's not just about generating new evidence, new scientific advances to inform science in general or to inform policymakers. We're actually developing a real world interventions something like games you can play as a child in school or as an adult woman in Nepal. A data collection app you can be using as a healthcare agent busy working in Brazil, who can suddenly do the same work much faster and easier and the data as opposed to being on a paper form and never being actually electronically recorded because it would be too much of a hard work, they haven't got a resource for, is immediately available to managers and decision makers electronically. It's also the component of uh, the actual intervention, which makes a difference right here, right now. Seeing the impact of my work is something I find tremendously rewarding and exciting about my research. Of course, we collect the data, we evaluate the interventions. We also publish a variety of papers and we do, co do cover all the disciplines we work in. So clinical disciplines, medical disciplines, antibiotic resistance, surveillance, early warning systems, public health intervention, risk communication, maternal health, computer science, data science. So we really bring together a spectrum of disciplines quite often working in the silo, which is also an exciting thing. But seeing the marriage between the intervention and the direct change we are achieving with the users all around the globe, with backed up by a data collection and a research, publishing a new result and new outcome, how effective these, uh, these interventions are, is I think the marriage from heaven. It's a win-win situation. And if you're interested in this field of research, I would really welcome you to get in touch, obviously either as a student, as I mentioned, joining us next month, but also in any other form of capacity. We, fall, we open to collaboration, open to internships. So do get in touch and I hope to collaborate with you in the future. So if we have no more questions, um, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been great to have you around. I hope uh, digital public health has kind of become a bit more closer and real to you through uh, my talk. And um, obviously COVID has made it quite topical these days. And I hope you will see the opportunity and also challenges of managing your healthcare and assisting public health through digital technology in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll also look back at the um, IRDR teaser talk slide before we finished. Thank you for joining. <laughs>